Our reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only eat then of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things, I will give instructions when I come. So last week, I said we were ending with the Lord's Supper, and that this week, that's where we'd start. And that's where we are right now with our sixth stanza from our disciple affirmation of faith, which says, At the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. Now, if you haven't figured it out by now, we disciples are into communion. Amen? Right? Uh, communion is a huge part of our worship life. Other churches criticize us for having communion every week. They'll say things like, oh, it's not special when you take it every week, or oh, when you do it so often, it, it loses its meaning. You know, it's just for show. Okay, well, other less ecumenically minded traditions, the critique is, well, it's just too high church. It's too Catholic. You know, and I'm, really? That's kind of weird. All right. Uh, truth is, the majority of Christian churches in the world, churches take communion at varying frequencies throughout the year. Some, like us, take it every week. Others take it once a month, like on the first Sunday of the month or something like that. Others take it quarterly, or what they'll do is they'll have it on fifth Sundays, kind of like on fifth Sundays, the upbeats lead worship and lead singing, well, that's the way it is in their churches. They take communion on fifth Sundays. Now, there's other churches that only take it once a year, and most of the time that's on what's called World Communion Sunday, which is the first Sunday in October. I know of two traditions that offer communion once a year, but you get in trouble if you actually take it. And yes, that is as weird as it sounds, but we'll, we'll get there, okay, we'll get there. Uh, churches across the denominational spectrum place different priorities on communion, and uh, it, it all depends on what the meaning of communion is to that particular tradition. For some, it is necessary for salvation. For others, it's tied directly to the last week of Jesus' life, which uh, we call the Passion. And it's uh, relevant, seems like, only around Lent and Easter, because that's when Jesus had his final meal with his disciples and, uh, in the 
room before he was crucified. And, you know, we're, we in the church are going like, well, what day? That must have been Thursday. That was Thursday. So ooh, wouldn't it be neat if we had a, a, a service that week during Holy Week? And we could have it on Thursday, and we can call it Maundy Thursday, and then spend the next few centuries debating about what the word Maundy means, right? But the theme of worthiness comes up quite a bit in some traditions, and for good reason, too. Because you'll notice that sometimes the words of institution that our elders use up here at the communion table are the same words that Bill read from 1 Corinthians 11. But we usually stop at verse 26, where it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, we run into some trouble after that. Uh, we go in to read past verse 26, and Paul writes, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Okay, that's, that's a little ambiguous. You know, exactly what is an unworthy manner? And Thursday night Bible study people, shh, don't give, give, shh, 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 just don't give that away yet. Uh, is being answerable for the body and blood of the Lord another way of saying if you don't get it right, his blood will be on your hands? Uh, Paul goes on to say, examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves now this sounds very serious it sounds like you better know thyself before you take communion or you will be judged and it will be your fault okay that's why there are a few traditions that only offer communion once a year and you get in trouble for not taking it okay who is worthy you know well you know in their estimation nobody's worthy so we, who are in the Christian church, disciples of Christ, that sounds weird to us because we are so accustomed to hearing about this open table, and how we are all invited, and how we are in the presence of Christ when we share communion with each other. Maybe it's because we rarely go past verse 26 in chapter 11 here, right? Uh, this is definitely something worth considering when one approaches the Lord's table. Uh, Self-examination and self-reflection are important when one accepts the invitation to come to the table and be in the presence of Christ. Okay, But as you know, we human beings can take things and make them more complicated than they are, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, especially when it comes to practice religion in public that that gets us into trouble too we get weird when that happens uh, especially as it relates to our understanding of God's grace and mercy now I can never express in mere words how much I learned about ministry from my clergy mentor Reverend Jack Music uh, now you can take upper division theology classes in September or in seminary till the cows come home but uh, until you have a quality supervised ministerial sterile experience you are you as a minister of the gospel will fall and fail hard fast and continuously this is why we have supervised ministerial experience and the best kind of clergy mentors are the ones who are salt of the earth types right uh, people who don't sugarcoat things. And that was my mentor, Reverend Jack Music. He was a hard-living, hard-drinking truck driver until he found Jesus, or Jesus found him. Uh, he, he, after he became a Christian, though, he received this call to ministry, which was amazing considering the life that he lived and the circumstances he grew up. But after he uh, became a Christian, he became a disciple pastor a decade before we even became a, a denomination in 1969. 
So you, these days, a person has to have a, a, ma- a minimum of a Master of Divinity degree in order to be ordained and get standing in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Jack didn't have that. Jack had four years of ministry in uh, a Bible college. Um, these days... You know, we would say that he was grandfathered in. So, you know, uh, in his four years of undergraduate uh, Bible college, he said that he has very little time or patience for ministers, scholars, or theologian who use what he called $10 words to make them look smart. Okay? Yeah. And the problem is, is my seminary at Emmanuel School of Religion and the clergy committee for uh, the Disciples of Christ, the, the, uh, the board that ordains or at least uh, gives permission for churches to ordain, uh, they were reluctant to let Jack have me as a, a mentee because technically at that point in my seminary education, I had more uh, education than Jack, but Jack had experience. We're talking long, hard experience in some pretty uh, wild churches, I guess we should say. Um, Jack made it his mission to help me survive my first pastorate and not get fired for, as he put it, some stupid rookie mistake that they didn't teach you about in seminary. Now please understand that any time I tell you all a story about Jack Music, my clergy mentor. I am sharing trade secrets that some pastors believe ought not to be shared with their congregations. Okay, kind of like how a magician or a professional wrestler uh, unveils the curtain of mystery to reveal the tricks of the trade. I do this. I do this because I want to keep it real, right? I don't, I don't want there to be secrets in between us. But just letting you know, pastors are human, okay? We, right? Amen? Thank you. All right. Every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, I would drive 10 minutes down uh, 460 to the little town of Narrows to the First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. And sometimes I would have to wait in the parking lot for a while because Jack wasn't known to be a morning person. And so I'd go in and I'd sit down with Jack across his desk and he would ask me how I was doing. He asked me what I planned on preaching on Sunday and if what I was learning in class was helping me in the real world. And then the weekly lesson would begin. And it usually started out with the words, Boy, let me tell you about ministry. And on one occasion I told him about uh, the elder. This, the elders in our church were having a really hard time convincing this guy uh, who was a very active member of the church to be an elder. They were looking for elders. It was a nominating committee. You nominating committee people know what they're going through. So they're having a hard time with one guy to say yes to being an elder. Now, the thing is, this guy always said no because he said, I'm not pause worthy. Okay? And he always always made it a big deal out of refusing communion. I mean, the the elders and the deacons would bring past the plate and things like that, and he'd, you know, do that before it was cool to do that. And he would, uh, you know, and and even when we would have communion where we would all go forward to serve, he'd get up, he'd come forward, but he made it a big deal that he would not take the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in an unworthy manner. Because he was not worthy. Okay? So Jack said, well, you've got to understand that in this part of the world, there's always one person in every church who makes a big deal out of not taking communion. It's usually a man. Sorry. And it's always somebody who lives an overly pious life, let's say. You know how Paul says the church is the body of Christ and everyone has a part in it? Well, these people are usually from the lower posterior side, if you get my meaning. (laughs) Some of these people come from old-timey traditions where communion is offered, but nobody takes it. 
Or who knows? Maybe this guy just doesn't want to be an elder, and if that is the case, then boy, you better count your blessings for dodging that bullet. So I said, yeah, Jack, but you know, I get what he's saying. Because Paul says, right here in 1 Corinthians 11, it's, it's, Paul says, do not come in an unworthy manner. He says, if we take communion in an unworthy manner, we are bringing judgment on ourselves. And Jack said, hell boy, ain't none of us worthy. <laughs> but that's the whole point of coming to the table. Reaching out for that bread and cup is the first step in making things right. Nothing we do is going to make us worthy. It is Christ who makes us worthy. This guy's refusal to take communion is false humility. It's a humble brag. It's for show, but the only thing it shows is that he doesn't get what grace is all about. This is why seminaries require supervised ministerial experience. I was just lucky enough to get Jack Music. God rest his soul. For years, we in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ have struggled with what to do about communion almost as much as we struggle about what to do with baptism, which we talked a couple of weeks ago about. Are these sacraments that we take, that we participate in, something that we keep to ourselves and only allow those who have passed our tests of fellowship to partake? See, the, the aha moment for our, one of our founders, Alexander Campbell, uh, he, he parted with the old light, help me with this, Mary, the old light, seceder, anti-burger, don't forget anti-burger, anti-burger seceder Presbyterian Scottish church. Yeah. It was a lot. You just couldn't say, oh, the Presbyterians. These were special Presbyterians. And so he, he had some issues with uh, what they were doing. It was one, one Sunday in Scotland, he was attending his church, and it was time to receive communion. And so in that church, you had to recite a creed that was very particular to this little niche in, uh, in that tradition. Now, if you passed that test, you received a little lead token. And with that lead token, you could go to the table where the communion was being served, and you could put that little lead token in a container, and the minister would give you what's called the host, the, the body and blood, the bread and the wine. Now, legend has it, that Campbell, who had a vision of the table that was open to anyone who confessed Christ, took his token, looked at it. In fact, we even have a little movie called Wrestling with God that was made 25 some odd years ago, and boy, it didn't age well, let me tell you. But Campbell took this lead token, and he stared at that lead token, and when he went to the table and had the choice of putting that token in the container, he slammed it down on the table, he turned his back, and he walked out of the church. Now, if I was making that movie again, I'd do it in slow motion with some rock and roll music in the back as he went, right? What a cinematic moment that would be. But Campbell then went to America to meet up with his father, Thomas. And they went on to establish our church, a church that declared an open table for all who confess Christ. Creeds were out. Except that over time, and you know this happens because you read about it in the Bible all the time, over time, uh, we started making that table smaller and smaller. We made it about us. Are we worthy? And then it became, are you worthy? Right? What do you have to do to prove that you're worthy? And pretty soon, fewer and fewer people were able to come to the table. 
We started coming up with barriers that made it so that humans once again became the ones who determined a person's worthiness to come to the table. In Bible study on Thursday night, we learned that the reference point for unworthy in the Corinthian church, in this church that Paul wrote this letter, uh, the reference point for unworthy in that church had nothing to do with one's private morality or whether the church administers the Lord's Supper in a correct way. The unworthiness had to do with how the Corinthian church was excluding people. In our affirmation of faith, we say at the table of the Lord, we celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. We forget that we aren't the ones who make us worthy. It is Christ. Thankfully, folks like Jack Music come along every so often and remind us. Here at First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Chico, California, as well as many other disciple congregations in the world, practice an open table where all are welcome and all can be made worthy by the saving acts and presence of Christ.